Hi, everybody. Wow, as far as science events go, this has been quite great so far, and there's no plastic in sight, which is amazing. Um, so I've been working on this issue now for what feels like a while, and I know there are a few of us in the audience who have too. Um, for me, it began back in 2011 when I was studying for a PhD focused on the impacts of microplastics on marine worms. During this time, there was evidence emerging to show microplastics in shellfish. So there I was, working on worms, looking at harm, all the while in the knowledge for, of our exposure to microplastics. And so that triggered my interest and concern. And so I joined the Medical Research Council Centre for Environment and Health to begin addressing some of the knowledge gaps across from human exposure to accumulation to toxicology. So there's been a wealth of work done by great researchers around the world focused on impacts and occurrence of microplastics. But today, I'm going to follow up on some of, what, of Dick's uh, presentation and really flag some of the knowledge gaps in relation to health and address where we need to be directing our research. So first, I think it's important to, to look at this as a holistic issue. So we've already heard how widespread this is. Now, back in 2015, Jenna Jambeck and colleagues published a seminal paper on mismanaged plastic waste. Now, they estimated that in 2010, between 4.8 and 12.7 million tonnes of plastic waste entered the environment. Now, that's plastic as large pieces ready to degrade into microplastics. However, that represented just between 15 to 40 percent of the total mismanaged waste in those areas. In other words, the majority was still on land, where it's susceptible to the same degradation pathways that it undergoes at sea. So degradation via sunlight. And when we combine that with sources of microplastics from abrasion, such as abrasion of synthetic clothing and synthetic tires from cars, we can see that this really is an issue here on land too. So we're exposed to a range of microscopic particles in our food and in the air on a daily basis. And as Dick's already mentioned, there are associated health effects with these exposures. So we know, for example, that air quality can affect uh, cardiovascular and respiratory health and, in fact, cause disease. And they're some of the biggest risk, risk factors of mortality worldwide. So when we consider microplastics, and that's especially in the air, we can consider them a new component or a newly recognised component of this particulate matter, because the reality is they've probably been around us for quite a while. That's because the same uh, abrasion and degradation pathways are just as applicable to back when mass production started in the 50s as it is today. So really, this isn't a new risk. It's probably something that's been around for a while. The real question is what contribution do microplastics have to these particle loadings and how do they uh, affect the associated health outcomes that we already see? I'm sorry, I'm going to keep drinking water. I had a cold earlier, so I've got a very dry throat today. So we've touched on the complexity of microplastics and really we should consider them a class of pollutants rather than a type. And it's this complexity that really uh, makes it difficult to predict and explore the health impacts. So we've heard about the additives and the microbes and the absorbed compounds. And I want you to think of this from, a, from an age perspective. So if we consider two different microplastic particles formed from the same way or formed in the same way at the same time, separated at birth, if you like... If we sample one from coastal, a coastal sample, it's likely to be rough and degraded and have an etched surface. It harbours microorganisms. It's probably got foreign chemical compounds on its surface. And then, because we've sampled it from the coast, the likely pathway to us is via a plate of shellfish or a, 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 a mussel or an oyster. So what does, it, does this matter? You know, do, does the uh, microplastic contribute any chemicals to our body? Is the dose so small compared to the actual muscle, muscle tissue that it doesn't matter? Are new chemicals generated in the cooking process? And what about its sibling, its counterpart, the microplastic that's freshly generated when we open a plastic bottle? It looks fresh and clean on the outside, but it's likely got quite a high contaminant burden on its inside from all its additives. And so these are the things we need to consider when we start to cons think about health. And you can see when you've got microbes and contaminants and additives and shape and type of plastic and size, that it's really difficult to start 
teasing out these variables because each one has its own impact on our biology. Now, one place we can look, this is the complexity of plastic, as I've just <laughs> mentioned, uh, one place we can look for answers is um, in the workplace. This is a very slow animation, I'm sorry. Um, one place we can look for answers is in the workplace. So there are industries where individuals are exposed to very high levels of plastic dust, um, typically via the air. And one of these uh, perhaps best-known examples is flock workers' lung. So this is people who work in the flocking industry establish this lung disease. Now, flock refers to short-cut nylon fibres. Um, and during the cutting process, typically when a rotary mill is used, a very fine respirable dust is generated. It's important to note here, actually, that the dust itself is not fibrous. It's, it's more like particles and elongated particles rather than actual fibres. But upon exposure, patients typically present with respiratory issues, so they have shortness of breath, they have cough, they have chest pain, and then their tissue shows inflammation and, in worst cases, scarring. Now, typically, removing patients from the workplace is enough to reverse the effects, and it's an effective therapy. But in the very worst cases, irreversible damage manifests, and the patients don't recover. Now, of course, this all happens at very, very high concentrations. We don't know how this translates to our environmental exposure. Um, and what, but what has been seen is that similar tissue responses have been observed for people exposed to polypropylene, polyethylene, and rayon fibres as well. And so the question is, is this a plastic issue? And are the responses observed in the airway similarly observed in other tissues? Now, animal studies have also replicated these observations. So when nylon flocking dust has been tested in animal models, mainly rats, via inhalation, inflammation has been shown uh, in one study 24 hours post-exposure to a single very high dose. However, the inflammatory effects did go back to normal after 29 days. But interestingly, an industry study that essentially looked at the same type of dust didn't find any inflammatory effects. So, we've got a big question mark here, and this is really emphasises the fact that we have a sporadic evidence base, sometimes with conflicting bits of um, conclusions. But what authors have noticed in other studies when animals have been exposed to polyurethane dusts and polypropylene dusts is that there's a tissue and inflammatory response quite similar to what's observed to other types of particulate matter. So again, here the question is, is this a plastic effect, or is this a particle effect? And that's something we really start to need to figure out. Now, there has been uh, a few recent publications looking at the effects of ingestion. Um, there's a bit less on uh, new studies on inhalation exposure routes. But recently, uh, a study looked at the effects of polystyrene microbeads of different sizes on human gut cells and in mice. Now, they found toxicity at the very highest doses up to the smallest microplastics. But when they fed the mice the same microplastics, they found some accumulation in the small intestine and intestinal tissues, but they didn't actually find much dispersion away from there. And this uh, high concentration um, leading to toxicity and the fact that there was limited effects observed in the mice led these researchers and the German Federal Institute of Risk Assessment to conclude that polystyrene microplastic ingestion is of low risk to intestinal health. Now, this is all probably prior to the knowledge of the very high doses of microplastics we get from a fancy cup of tea. Um, and also, I want to ask, how representative is, is a polystyrene bead? You know, we're not exposed to polystyrene beads. We're exposed to fragments and shards and really irregular shapes. And so there's a real question mark here over the role of shape um, and how that influences cellular interactions and harm. Because we know, for example, that fibres um, can cause harm uh, in our immune cells. So our immune cells are there to essentially try and clear up all the debris and foreign particles in our body, in our um, airways and gut. And what typically happens with fibres is that they struggle to remove the long ones, the ones that they can't fully enclose. And because they're secreting lots of chemicals to try and break down um, this foreign particle, they end up causing lots of tissue damage um, to, their, to themselves and surrounding cells. And so the question is, does this happen with plastic fibres too? We know it's the case for asbestos and carbon nanotubes, but what about plastic? 
So at King's College, we're really focused on the air. Um, we are aware that we need to consolidate concentration uh, exposure values, especially in health-relevant fractions. So we've been applying Raman spectroscopy and spectral imaging to try and detect these small microplastics in air samples. We've also been applying these methods to tissue with a focus on lung tissue biopsies to find real-world evidence of plastic uptake in the lung. And then, of course, we want to link external exposures and internal uptake and pathologies with uh, the knowledge of what mechanisms are driving those effects and essentially what parameters of microplastics cause toxicity. And we're doing this in human lung cells. Now, this is all very uh, current research. So for those interested, please come and find me because the results haven't undergone peer review. So moving forward, uh, we're in a knowledge acquisition phase. It's exponential, and so I think we are really we need to take some responsibility and generate some robust, transparent evidence because we have livelihoods and economies and the environment and health depending on these outcomes. But where do we take this moving forward? We need to fully characterise what we're exposed to, and that's concentration, size distribution, chemical profile, microbial profile. We need to understand exactly what we're dealing with when it comes to um, health effects. And of course, there's the, the idea of the chemical leaching. You know, do microplastics act as a carrier? We've got to understand whether they actually contribute a relative dose of their associated chemicals to us, and if that pathway is meaningful compared to other pathways of our exposure to those chemicals. And finally, we really need to start testing relevant microplastics, so the stuff that's actually in our food, in the air, in the environment, and really figure out how specific those effects are to plastic and not just to particles. And I think that's a real question um, moving forward for us as researchers. So that felt very fast. <laughs> It was very fast. And, but thank you very much for your attention, and thank you to the organisers for having me. And I can't wait to have a discussion and hear all your results.